but I want to know all of you. And uh, maybe you don't know each other. So pass the mic. Julie Anderson and almost two months. Catherine and like four weeks. If you're on a team, let me know. I'm Tyson and about a month. I'm Cade, uh, a little over two months now. I'm Caroline, um, about nine months. I've actually done Ignite, but I wanted to come back to this one. I think it's important. And I'm on the Red Sign team. I'm Tyler, and I've had my license for a little over three months. I'm Cash, um, started the first of this month, so three weeks. And then um, I think most of you know me, but I'm Steph Ashby. I'm on Peter Merkel's team and got my swag on today. Um, I've been a realtor for the past three years and then several years back before I had kids, a uh, couple years. I think I've sold around 80 homes. So like I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm not a mega agent by any means, but I've been selling about 20 homes a year. So enough to stick around and stay in this industry and make a living off of it, which is cool. So um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about keeping your leads. So the last, what, couple of weeks you've been talking about getting leads, right? Okay. Oh, where's the, do we have the... Um, whiteboard. Thank you. I was just going to do kind of a little review and just write down, um, kind of your, what are your biggest takeaways? And I'm going to let this mic be the crowd mic. Um, what are your biggest takeaways and people on zoom, please feel free to chime in as well on how to acquire leads and grow your database and find other lead sources that maybe you're not always already using. Um, this is something that actually Lee said um, a couple of days ago. Anyways, we were talking. Lee, uh, Lee, Lee. Anderson. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, we were talking about uh, uh, for sale by owners and how when you drive past the sign, you just need to go like talk to them. Just instead of instead of driving past it or being like, oh, I'll remember it later, just stop right there and then just go talk to them, especially if you're in business mode. So I like it. Yep. Be safe about that though, guys. <laughs> and leave something with them. Like I always like to, not a business card, but you're, you're there to build rapport, not to, not to help them sell it themselves, but to, to build that relationship of honesty and give them a smile that you're there because they are going to feel overwhelmed they are going to feel lost and you're going to be there. And that's when le listing presentations come. So it's helpful to have some sort of marketing material to give them like how to, how to stage their house or what curb appeal is or any, something like that. It helps. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Don't try and give them all the tips, but I do that as a new realtor. Well, you can do this. So I'm like, well, I've got to bring them value. So I'll just kind of tell them how to do it. And maybe they'll still be overwhelmed. Uh, but you're right. Like my brother-in-law years ago out in Arizona tried to Fizbo's house and he's like the most mellow guy ever. And um, my sister was like, yeah, Taylor's been angry very angry. Like every day he's like furiously angry, not at like anybody, but just like so frustrated and overwhelmed with trying to sell his own house that he was like angry. I'm like, Taylor, really? Like it's, it's, and you just don't think about it. It's like, yeah. Imagine going in to like sell this huge asset and have no idea what you're doing. I think most people don't realize the liability they're taking on either. Like a big, a big value add we're bringing as realtors is that we're like us and our brokerage, we're taking on a ton of liability and we're taking it off their plate. Um, so they don't realize that. So yeah, I like, I like your idea, Lee, of, um, of giving them some easy tips that aren't going to tell them how to sell the house, but yeah, staging, that's a fun thing, you know, but they're still going to be like 
okay, actually, can you sell my house? <laughs> Cause I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, so I like it. Cool. Cool. Um, what else? Oh, Molly, thank you for the whiteboard. Good suppose. And I know a lot of realtors, um, and even me from time to time will keep things in their car just to have them on hand. So whether that's like a pop by gift for clients that you might be driving by, you weren't planning on being in that area, but since you are, it's like, awesome. I've already got something in my car. I can stop by, but Fizbo's, if you're going to make a habit of doing that, maybe have a little, a little packet, like a two page stapled, whatever tips on staging your home or, um, curb appeal or, you know, whatever, but, but it might be a good idea just to have a few things in your trunk ready to go for wherever you're at. Okay. What else? What other, what other things have you learned about gathering those leads? And I want to review this because we're going to talk about how are we going to keep them? So it's important to kind of refocus on like, where are we getting these leads? What are these leads? Who are they? You can take a minute to think too. Okay, social media. Is that you, Cade? Who said that? Tell us more. Uh, social media, just, you know, trying your best to let people know what you're doing and advertising yourself, but not too much. Kevin had a really good uh, ratio with it where every five posts he uh -huh. does something that's real estate related mm -hmm. so then four that's just regular and then the next one is real estate so that's awesome yeah 80 20 is how he described and that's it. accurate no one wants to have like real estate shoved down their throat every right. day by their one friend that's annoying because then you get like <laughs> unfollow yeah um i love it yeah so stuff that's funny stuff that's fun stuff that's interesting funny pictures of your kid or your dog or just whatever. And then you're sprinkling in the real estate. Right. And, um, and that's something we'll talk more about as well. Um, as we get into this discussion today is just using social media as kind of this, this baseline of top of mindness, if that makes sense. Like if I have a couple of people that are slipping through the cracks, I'm just not getting to everybody. At least they're seeing my social media posts as the year goes along. And like, I have gotten deals that way, just like people like sending me questions on Facebook messenger. So I know they're, <laughs> this is where they're at. They're on Facebook and they're like, oh yeah, Steph, she's a realtor they're talking to me and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've been horrible at keeping in touch with them. I'm so glad I've been posting about real estate. Right. Yeah. Well, me personally, you know, I have a lot of people where I don't necessarily have their phone numbers. I can't directly <laughs> contact them. So yes. social media is the only way that I can get a hold of them. Yes, exactly. And it's very non-intrusive too, right? It kind of breaks the ice and allows those types of people that you're maybe not as close with, you don't have their number or whatever, maybe you haven't, you know, maybe they're an old high school buddy or whatever. Um, they can see that you're the expert and then they're going to be a, like way more comfortable when you start talking to them um, to like open up and ask you questions about like, by the way, I've noticed your realtor. I had a question about this or my brother wants to sell his house and he doesn't know anybody, you know, stuff like that. So good point. Oh, where is the thing? <clears throat> forward now. Cool. So yeah. Um, so we've been through the generate your leads, grow your database, capture leads in different ways, open houses, social media, um, love the FISBO idea. Any other ideas that came up during those classes? The open houses. Yeah, what was your biggest? takeaway on the open house one. I love to do open houses. So I'm extra curious about that one. What did you learn about like the best way to capture those leads? Um, well, we, we do a, we do a $50 Amazon giveaway. Um, and so we just have people sign in for that. And then that's how we know their name, their phone number. And if they're working with a realtor. Or if you take Carl's idea, hot dogs. Hot dogs so we, we did a barbecue and we barbecued hot dogs. And then Carl was standing in the middle of the road yelling at people to come get free hot dogs. So 
It works. That's awesome. Oh, I love it. Carl's the best. So hot dog. Okay. Yeah. So something to attract the people, right? A little bit more than come check out your neighbor's house, which is usually what I'm all about. And that's usually like a time issue for me, but he's probably getting a much higher return. Have you gotten some good leads doing that with him? Yeah. Are you working with any of those people currently or will be in the next little bit? You are Tyler. Awesome. So it works, right? Cool. I like it. Any other lead sources that you're like, either you're already doing, or you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That blows my mind. I'm going to implement that this year. Yeah. Prospecting. You can go knock on doors and get leads there. Okay. Yep. And always, 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 always be super safe when you're door knocking, et cetera. But yeah, door knocking. If that's your thing, I know a lot of realtors, like it's their jam and they get a lot of deals every year by door knocking because they do it consistently, right? Um, so today we're just going to focus in on now that we've got all these leads, how are we going to keep them? How are we going to turn them into actual business? Because it kind of sucks to put all this time and effort and work and blood and sweat and tears into getting these leads and then just not following up and not doing anything with them. Um, the cool thing about this, about keeping your leads, doing follow-up and you've, you've all heard fortunes in the follow-up, right? <clears throat> like that's the thing. The fortune is in the follow-up. Um, and I guess I've heard it so many times that I feel like everyone already knows it, but fortune is in the follow-up and, um, most realtors will talk to a new lead, say from an open house or whatever like maybe the one time at the open house, maybe they'll follow up once, but to get to the third or fourth, like statistically, I wish I had, I should have brought that chart, but, um, Shoni shared it in a team meeting a couple months ago. Statistically, most realtors aren't making it past the second touch, which is kind of sickening considering all the work that goes into this. Right. Um, so what's really cool. What the good news about that is that we can be the ones who get to the third touch, the fourth touch, the fifth touch. And then this person's like, this is kind of the real estate person in my life. They've talked to me so many times. They're so nice. They keep bringing me value. And then the second they have a need, it's like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to call Steph. Like she knows what she's doing. She's obviously doing this every day. I keep hearing from her, I'll, you know, and, um, and that's the goal is to follow up so you can keep those leads. Um, and, and make sure that this time and effort hasn't gone to waste. So what is lead follow-up? We're going to talk about what is lead follow-up, how to lead follow-up, what you're doing post lead follow-up. Uh, what would you assume lead follow-up is? Yeah. Oh, can you grab the mic from Cade for our awesome zoomers? They can hear. <clears throat> I was just saying, we all know what a follow-up is. So it literally is exactly what it says, follow up. So what is that? What does that literally look like? You're sitting in your office or wherever Re, and you're following up with people. What are you doing? You're contacting them. So it's whether it's a phone call, a text, an email, it's anything that is to touch base. Yeah. Touching base, checking in. And it can be as simple as checking in. I like to have a reason to contact my people. And if I don't, like if I don't have an event to invite them to, or if I haven't seen anything recently on social media, like they just had their first grandbaby born, you know, then I can be like, Hey, I saw your first grandbaby is born. But if I don't have a reason, it's just like, Hey, I was just thinking about you. I wanted to check in. How are you doing? And by the way, were you still thinking of wanting to sell your cabin or sell your second home or whatever, sell your house and downsize or upside, whatever it is that you've talked to them like in the last few years about, are you still thinking of doing that? And that's it. And then after the business move on to more of how are you doing? What's happening? So you're keeping that relationship going and they know you're not just calling for the business. They know that you care about them as a human, um, and as a person and, um, and that'll just, you know, it's just nurturing your people, essentially. Um, and I think most of you were here last time when I taught 
but we did talk about like when you're, when you're calling people get to business quickly and, and first, like, Hey, how are you doing by the way, business? Okay. Back to you. That way, if you do it the other way around, they're like, Oh, the reason they called <laughs> was they just wanted my business. And that whole conversation about me and my kids and my health issue and whatever kind of didn't matter to them. It's funny how that works. It's all one conversation, but just slip it. So they know that you're like, okay, now the business is out of way, out of the way. How are you doing? And it, it just makes a huge difference for people. Thoughts or questions on any of that. Okay. So the life of a lead. Um, and the reason why, especially in real estate, the fortunes and the follow-up is that the life of the lead outside of this nutty market we've been in the past several years is like seven to 10 years. So right now, like I've had clients call me up a year after they've bought and they're like, well, I'd like to sell and cash out and do this. Thing. Like I had one girl's like, I want to cash out and go back to school. I'm like you are awesome. That's the only reason I would not discourage you to sell your home. You're investing in your education. That's huge. Um, but, but most people are like a year or two out. They're like, we have so much equity. We don't know what to do with it. We want a bigger house. Like, sweet, let's do this. But normally um, you're going to see that seven to 10 years. Um, I think in the near future, we'll see that three to five years for a little bit. And then, you know, if, as the market evens out, it'll get back to that seven to 10 year cycle. So, um, so they're just moving every so often. A lot of people, you know, people get their kids into a school. They love their school. They don't want to move. You know, there are reasons or their job is really great. Um, but seven years out, they're getting transferred to a different state or whatever. So, um, so different reasons, or there's a divorce or whatever, but typically you're going to see that longer cycle. Um, and so in that time, it's really hard to feel like, um, like a lot of realtors are like, I just need to focus on my, my highest return person right now. Like who's going to close the soonest, like that guy's probably five years out, like I just don't have time to invest in them. Um, and don't get sucked into that because what's going to happen is like, you're not filling your pipeline and you just have to remember my pipeline may be a seven year pipeline. So the people who are seven years out, you've got to be marketing to them now and nurturing them now so that in seven years you have more deals, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and right now that looks like three to five years, um, which does make it feel easier, but, um, definitely focus on your next people, but also don't forget how important it is to nurture the people who still may be a little ways out. What's another benefit to nurturing leads that may not be moving soon. Just referrals. Um, you know, they might not be moving, but their brother probably is. So if you're the, if you're their go-to real estate guy, then they're like, Hey, you should call him. I love that. And referrals are huge. Um, if you think about the, uh, the lifetime value of one key person in your database and your sphere of influence, um, you know, Shoni shared that like one person may mean, a million dollars over the lifetime in commissions for you because of a handful of deals you'll do with them directly and then several referrals from them. So even if they're sending you a referral once a year, once every other year, um, yeah, it depends on how well connected they are. The more connected people might be like sending you a few a year um, or even more. Um, but yeah, there's so much value in nurturing those people and getting their referrals. Uh, because then what happens with those, I'm going to erase this now. What happens with those referrals? It's just a tree. It's just a tree. Yeah. So Julie said, it's just a tree, but just correct. So you might have, can you guys see the green marker? Okay. Is that working? Um, so you might have Bob here and he just bought a house with you. Okay. First time buyer. And then five years down the road in our market, more realistic, five years, he buys another house or sells that house and buys, buys and sell BS and <laughs> um, not BS to us though. And then, you know, maybe eight years out, maybe 15 years out, just whatever it is, right? So you're going to get a handful of deals with him. But in the meantime, yeah, you've got one here with his brother because he was so impressed with how well you did his deal. 
And then maybe over here, grandma um, passed away. His family needs guidance and help on how to sell their home, whatever. He does a deal with you because he's, you know, he's like, oh, you took such great care of my family. You're awesome. I'm for sure using you on my next sale and purchase. And then, you know, like more and more impressed. And as the years go by and they get older and they're more connected, people just meet more people throughout their life, right? So they're going to get more and more connected and you'll probably see more and more referrals as long as you are doing what? Keeping your lead. Oh, following up. Yeah. with value and with, yeah, with value and, and the value may be just a great relationship. Like this person cares about me and calls to see how I'm doing. Sometimes they pop by with a gift. They invite me to their splash summit event every year, you know, whatever it is. It's like, this person cares about me. That's what it all comes back to, but they are not going to feel like you care about them. If you're not doing what following up, follow up. Yeah. So one thing that you already, you already said, but as the more they're connected, people cannot stay stagnant. You either go behind or you move forward. So their market is going to constantly change. So as their market changes and what do you mean by their market? They're constantly meeting new people. Okay. Oh, so their sphere. They, yeah. yeah their so sphere. their sphere yeah. is going to change and grow over the years. Right. And exactly. so somebody that they didn't know a year ago needed to buy, but you know, they meet them in a year and you're still following up with that person. Like they're going to constantly be meeting new people unless they become recluses. Right. So, so like a rookie mistake I made, um, and Clay Winder will tell that will tell you this. He trained me as a new agent and it was like, in my brain, it was like, sweet. I'm closing this person. Where's the next deal? Sweet. They're done. Where's the next deal? Sweet. Where's, you know, it was just like, I was a one track mind for who's my next deal. <laughs> I was like overly excited. And I was like, oh my gosh, you can make such good money if you just keep rolling. You know, just my brain was in the wrong place. Um, and then as I've gotten older, because that was back in like 2013, 14, I had kids, I've grown up a little bit. I came back to KW after we moved back from Indiana a few years ago. And I was just paying a little more attention to nurturing your sphere of influence. And then I joined up with Peter and that man is like the king of nurturing his sphere. I've rarely seen anyone better at it uh, because everyone in his sphere loves him because he loves them. And how do you not love someone who just like does pop buys and calls you on your, he calls them on their birthday. I'm so bashful about that. Like I will send a text rather than post on Facebook. I know that gets drowned in all the Facebook happy birthdays, but the man calls everyone he knows on their birthday. So every day he's calling a few people for their birthday. And I'm like, I don't know. It would drive me nuts if a million people called me on my birthday. So I still feel bashful, but like they love it. They just love it. And so, um, anyway, so I'm learning like this whole nurturing your sphere of influence thing. And I'm seeing like, wow, like, look at the, you know, like Shoni explained to us, like, look at the lifetime of one person. And it's not just about the one deal. It's about the relationship. And yes, we have to make a living. Yes, we've got to do the deals, right? Otherwise, we're not going to survive in this industry. But it's amazing how when you put first things first, you put that relationship first um, and nurture those people, the deals are going to come. It's just going to happen. Stay consistent. Show them you care about them. Um, and then those referrals will come in. And you're absolutely going to be their person when, um, when they've got a deal of their own to do questions or thoughts about that. So the last class, um, the guy had told us about, um, the personal marketing company. And so it's 25 bucks. So after you get a sell, it's $25. And then they go and market them four times a year for five years. Okay. For what? 25 bucks. Say that again. Say that again. You pay a one-time fee of One-time fee of $25. What is this called? <laughs> May I adopt this? Yes. I know please. it's the personal marketing company. And they do this for realtors or for yeah, so all kinds of sales? You give them, you give them your photo right. and your info, and okay. then they market them. They send them things four times a year for five years. Holy crap. So where I'm trying to figure out what's their business model and how are they staying in business? Are they also somehow getting 
I don't know. I only pulled up the website to remember. Oh, okay. So you pulled it. You say I haven't used it yet or no. Okay. No, they they, use it or who taught last, who taught yesterday? Colby. Colby. Yeah. So Colby Kerr uses it. Yeah. Or he told us about it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I'm going to ask Colby about that. Let's all ask Colby about that. Well, he was telling us about it last night. So, I mean, last night. Last time. On, <laughs> yeah. What are we on guys? Wednesday. I know <laughs> the days are all, lost many days. It's yeah. the end of the school year for my kids. And the days yeah. are all like a big, but I went, I went back to my, my team and I was like, we need to look at this okay. because that's so he was just teaching on Monday telling you about this. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. We pay for service. Our, our team does a service where when someone closes on a purchase, um, cause we do different things on the listing side, but when someone buys a home, we, oh, what is it called? Josh takes care our director of ops, Josh Barrett takes care of it, but it's a service that every month they're getting something. Um, for example, one of them is a tape measure. It's got the Peter Morkel logo on it and it's got our phone number on it. And then it's got that person's name. So it's like their personalized little measuring <laughs> measure tape or tape measure. And then, um, we've got like a water bottle that goes out and, I think an Amazon gift card goes out like at the beginning of the year. And then one more time at the end of the year, just like a few little things like, Hey, thanks again for your business. Like, can you imagine the kind of impact that's making on our buyers for a whole year? And I don't know how much that costs. That will be, I'll write his name now in case you guys don't know him. That is a Josh Barrett question, but I, I really like that company. And there are a lot of companies out there that do stuff like this. I think this one that Colby told you guys about is probably the cheapest I've ever heard of. I want to look into that. Um, and is that, did he say you guys, is this something for when you like after you close a deal or is this just period? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I can't believe that a one-time fee of 25 bucks. That's nuts. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So less expensive. Okay. And I love this for the new agent because it's just like, where do I spend my money as a new agent? There's a million things you can do. And what you don't want to do is spend all your money and be like, oh crap, that didn't work. (laughs) You know, that sucks. And now I just spent all my money and I've closed zero deals because my marketing didn't work. Right. Um, Because we want to have a foundation of prospecting and the support of marketing, not the other way around. Right. So I love this um, because that's a nice little touch. And then if you're sprinkling, so if that's four times a year, that can be part of your 36 touch plan or whatever, right? And then you're sprinkling in the pop buys, the phone calls, the birthday cards, you know, your own personal touch, inviting them to a couple events that year. Um, I like it. Thanks for sharing that, Julie. Um, oh, it was Colby. <laughs> and thank you, Colby. I'll, I'll tell Colby. Thank you. He is awesome. Um, Someone read this quote, Tyler. If you aren't first or second in their mind, you probably won't get the business. It feels like that's true. On the consumer side of things, when you're thinking about businesses you purchase from, um, what are they doing so that you're purchasing from them? Here's an example. McDonald's is right there, right? McDonald's. Like how many commercials do we see for McDonald's? How many McDonald's do we see everywhere? How many billboards do we see? What are they doing so that you're, you're like, oh yeah, McDonald's. I don't know. Maybe if you don't, unless you have like little kids or something. (laughs) (laughs) McDonald's was like on my banned foods list until my oldest was like three. And I was like, I give up. I give in. (laughs) But, um, but what are they doing differently than Jack in the box? Is that still in business? I don't know. <laughs> they what, wait, talk in the mic. Oh. It is that they have a cloud. They have a cloud. Kids. That doesn't hurt. That doesn't hurt. But what are they doing? Marketing. Marketing like crazy. And what is, where is that putting them? Top of mind. Top of mind. Okay. You're just staying top of mind. And I actually love that. Um, the Gary in the, the MREA book says first or second. Cause you can be second. That's okay. Like I have a lot of friends who are like really close with another realtor and that's cool. And sometimes they use the other realtor and sometimes they use me, you know, and that's fine. Um, and I do love what Peter always says. Um, cause we have a conversation with like our top 50 people and let them know like, Hey, 
by the way, the reason you're getting all these invites to these events we're doing and these pop by gifts and stuff is like, I just appreciate your business and your support, but I also want you to know, like I, um, okay. As you can tell, I haven't mastered this conversation yet, but, um, just like, like you're one of my people, like I depend not, I depend on, but you'll get the gist, right? Don't use this wording. Okay. Just don't. <laughs> I had a migrant in the last few days. So my brain's a little fuzzy. Sorry guys. Uh, but just like, you're one of my people that I depend on for referrals and business support and whatever. So would you be offended if I asked you to, um, refer your friends to me? If anyone ever mentions that they have a real estate need, will I be the first person you tell them to call or whatever? Um, so something along those lines, we're having that conversation with them. And, and that's when we learn, like, actually my brother just got into real estate. So if that happens, usually it's like, oh yeah, for sure. You're my guy. You're my girl. Um, but if it's my brother or my uncle or whatever, or my neighbor, like my best friend's actually a realtor too, you're awesome. But I feel like, you know, so then the conversation turns to, oh, great. That's awesome. If for any reason, she's no longer doing real estate at some point, or she's tied up, unavailable, swamped, whatever. Um, will I be your second choice um, to refer to your friends or for yourself? And it's like, yeah, for sure. And it's much better to establish that ahead of time than for them to shut you off in their brain completely as like, well, I've already got my person. And then if they're swamped, they're not thinking of you and they go find whoever, you know what I mean? comments. Questions. I had a crap load of agents on my back. And the only way to get them off my back was to become an agent myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. So just stay top of mind for a second, whatever things change. I've got a friend that went to the same high school as me. I met her at an open house at her neighbor's house. Her aunt is a realtor. I think she's a lot older than me. I'm like, well, she'll probably retire <laughs> before I do. So, you know what? I'm still, you know, she's not at my, she's not in my top 50, but she's just right under it. She's the person I want to talk to at least twice, three, four times a year, whether it's inviting her to like one event, texting her about something I saw on Facebook, whatever. Um, so, so keep those people around, keep those people in your follow-up system. People move, people leave the industry, people retire. So just be there for those people, for your friends, when those other people in their lives are not doing real estate anymore. Um, okay. This, let me move this little zoom thing. So you guys can kind of see the chart better. Okay. There we go. Ah, that's no good either. Okay. You guys can see that down there, right? So 19 touches each year on your lead one high value touch to convert them to a contact and then 36 touches each year. Um, so I really like this. Like when I first got into Keller Williams in 2013, I think we just had like a 33 touch. It was just like the one thing, like maybe the eight by eight as well to like get them into your sphere or get them into your database. But I like how they've kind of outlined um, there's, there's a lot more activity that's going on to turn a lead into like a database person. So it's no longer like some guy I met at the open house is like someone I'm putting in my database as like a legit lead, I would say. Um, and then they're going to become your contacts, like your sphere, like your true sphere of people I contact and talk to and communicate with on the regular, um, once they're there, you're going to do a different system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, no, you're good. Question about open houses. So, you know, if you know that they have a realtor, they filled out the sheet. What do you do personally as far as like follow up? Because I definitely don't like, I want to respect other realtors, but I want to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. And I feel like, hey, Trent. Hey, guys. Um, I think every realtor has a different take on that. Mine is, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I'm a little more bashful about it. Um, it's interesting. I'll give you an example of someone that, so Peter had this listing in the neighborhood he used to live in for like 10 years. Everyone in that neighborhood does real estate with him. Um, he had since moved out of that South Provo neighborhood into Mapleton and he sold one of the homes. The buyer the realtor was kind of a train wreck 
and uh, a couple things went wrong or were weird or something. And Peter was the one going over to the house to help these buyers who were not his clients <laughs> with the problem, like not trying to step on the other guy's toes, but just like, these are people and they need help. So I'm going to go help them. Um, Peter's just got a big heart and that's why he's so successful because he loves everybody. Um, but those people ended up selling that home with Peter a few years later. And so that's not necessarily the open house example, but it's kind of an example of the attitude you can take on certain things. Um, so for me and my ADHD and my little kids and my special needs kid, it's like, I have to be careful with my time on how much how many people I'm putting into my database. So someone who comes into an open house and already has a realtor for me personally, I'm not putting them in my database. Sometimes I do. If they have like sat there with me for 10 minutes and asked me about the house and like, I think they'll probably want to make an offer. Um, yeah, I'll follow up with them and I'll follow up with their realtor. I'll find out who their realtor is and, and text them. Hey, your people so-and-so came into my open house. Sounds like they're really interested. Let me know if you'll be submitting an offer. If so, I can keep an eye out for it. So that's where I go with it. But every realtor you talk to will probably have a different take. It just depends on how aggressive you want to get, what your time is like. If you have a tiny database, if you didn't like grow up here and your sphere is tiny, maybe go after that. Just keep in touch every once in a while. Um, cause you know, expired listings happen. People decide they don't like their realtor. Um, actually, oh, actually I had a really good closing last year off of an open house person who had a realtor. Now that I think of it, this is the only time this has happened. They came in on Brenda McIntosh's listing. She's on my team. I was doing her like $1.6 million listing in Provo. And these people came in, they already had a realtor. And we just kind of chit chatted. We realized like, oh, you're from Irvine, California. That's where my mom grew up. My grandparents are still there. Who are your grandparents? The Hilts. Oh my gosh, we love the Hilts. We know them. So it was just like this, a little bit of a rapport, which made it easier. Um, but a few weeks later, it's a high price home. So it sat for a couple months, you know, I'm doing another open house mm -hmm. and he comes in again. I'm like, oh, are you thinking about this again? And blah, blah, blah. And we get to talk in some more and he just is not a fan of his realtor. His realtor is not answering his calls very much. He's not taking very much initiative to help them out. And they're like, we'd like to buy a place sooner than later. You know, like they had just moved up from Irvine and we're in a temporary place. And they wanted to move forward. And I'm like, you know, they're at a million dollar price point. I'm like, who is this realtor? Why are you neglecting them? They're like <laughs> ready to go. They're at a nice price point. What the heck is going on? And I'm like, well, have you signed anything with them? No, if you feel like he's not serving you well, would you be interested in letting me serve you? Cause I'm going to hustle <laughs> and I'm going to take care of you. And he was like, yeah, you know, so it really depends on who the person is, what the situation is. Like if they're realtors, their brother, I'm not even going to think twice about them, but these people are like, there's a little personal connection and they didn't like the realtor. So yeah, I mean, just, just talk to people, feel it out. But, you know, it goes back to like creating relationships. You just start with the relationship. They're going to open up. You're going to learn more about them. And then if there's an in, you're going to find it in the most authentic way and the non slimy sales way, if that makes sense. So yeah, Julie. Okay. So here's another scenario. And I was actually going to contact Peter and ask him because so last weekend I did an open house for Peter and we only had one person come through, but also I found out that this house has been under contract five times. <laughs> so everybody was already seen this house. Uh, it was in, um, Salem. Salem. Oh, yeah. The yeah. blue house. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, so this guy comes in and he's like, he's actually very interested in the house. He has an agent. Um, uh, he has a good relationship with his agent. Like we had good conversation, all that jazz. Um, so here's my question. So obviously he hasn't made an offer on the house. Okay. Then Peter goes and posts on our KW agent page saying, Hey, my client is going to knock the price on this on Thursday. So I was going to ask Peter and I just want your take. I was going to ask Peter, would you like me to contact this person just to be nice and say, Hey, by the way, I just found out that this price, you know, the house of the price is going down. Uh, I just wanted you to be aware or should Peter contact him? See, I'm no matter what, not the agent. Yeah. 
you know, so I'm just trying to figure out where I want to. Yeah. But I also want to. So like, are you like. For myself. So I want right. To be kind, but what would be the better. Approach? I mean, I mean, this is definitely, definitely a nice service to just give someone a heads up. Why not? Like, you yeah. know, we're all human and you're being a nice human. Um, there is a potential there's, there's, you can't go wrong with being nice. You definitely can't go further than like, Hey, just wanted to let you know. Um, but that would open the door for a conversation. If they're like, you know what, my rules are sex right now. I can't get a hold of them. And I kind of do want to make an offer on that house. Oh, okay. Well, do you want to check back in with them? If you can't get a hold of them, call me back up. I'll help you get that offer in. But I do need to know, have you signed something official with him, her, whoever, um, if they're like, no, and they suck and I hate them and please help me write this offer. Then it's like, okay, like you're sure you haven't signed anything. I'll help you write that offer and I can represent you. That might be one little fat chance of an in. Um, but other than that, like can't hurt. I'm like, I'm, I doubt I'll, there will be in. Yeah. Yes. And that's how Peter's got a lot of deals. <laughs> that agent was helping me, even though they were my agent. Yeah, okay. totally. It, it can't hurt to be nice and to be cordial and to like take a minute to call them and follow up. Um, and most of the time I'll just tell you, cause I've been trying to get in the habit. It's, it's about the habit. So if you're in the habit of doing stuff like that, something will come of it at some point, most of the time, nothing's going to come of it. And that's okay. It's, it's good to be in the habit of that. And usually stuff like that takes very little of your time. So yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. For the most Follow-up question. I guess, I guess it is. I mean, so yes, that's a good idea. Okay. But is it better to never mind? <laughs> I love it. You have a brain like mine. I'm like, and it's gone. Okay, go for it. So my question was if they've signed a buyer broker agreement, we can't legally do anything, right? No, and it's they're... like big code of ethics yeah. issues. So so be careful. That's so I say it doesn't hurt to be polite, cordial, thoughtful, you know, like, hey, the price was knocked down, thought you'd want to know. Okay, you can't be like, by the way, is your realtor like even helping you with this? No, like you can't go, don't go there. Like you don't want to lose your license, you don't want to be kicked off the board of realtors. Not worth it, guys. Just be in the habit of like being helpful and doors will open up. But like, yeah, you've got to be so careful. We are not in the business of stealing other people's clients. But if they're genuinely being neglected, like my clients were last year, it's like, well, someone's got to help them. Like, seriously, they need to buy a house. <laughs> that guy's not doing it for them. They don't want to work with them anymore. That's where your windows, your, your doors open, you know, but um, be careful. Don't steal clients from there's the pie is big enough. There's enough of the pie for everyone to get a piece of business. All right. Did that answer your question? It, it did. I've got another okay. one after you're done. Okay. So if they have signed already like a BBA, but they're like, we really don't want to work with this realtor. What do you do? Or do you just say, Hey, you need to figure that out with them or. Yeah. And what I do is call Peter and be like, what should I do? Um, and you can call Dean or if you're on a team, call your rainmaker. But, uh, but seriously, it, unless they're like, not even sure to go about it, it can be just a conversation with their realtor. Like, look, I can't steal their business. It's a code of ethics issue. Just tell you, just educate your people. This is a code of ethics issue. I can help you. I want to help you. But what I need you to do is have a conversation with your realtor and um, have them tear up that contract, get it in writing, text, fine, email, fine. Just have it in writing. Don't have just a verbal conversation because there are many, many realtors who will come back and say, but I had a contract. You client owe me money. Like the seller paid this other realtor for, you know, cause they represented you on the purchase, but now you have to pay me. And so your clients are going to be stuck having to pay 10 grand to this guy over here who used to be their realtor and told them, sure, you can have it out, but like they need to cancel it. And is there a form? This doesn't happen that like, I haven't used this that often. I think there may be a form where they can they can fill something out stating that that contract is now void or whatever. 
that's why I asked Peter, ask Dean, ask your rainmaker, just ask a broker, um, but make sure it's done properly, make sure it's in writing. And then that way your client, I mean, cause you're going to get paid. Like if they sign a BBA with you, you close the house, they're going to pay KW Westfield, KW Westfield's paying you, you're fine. But now your person is screwed and they're never going to work with you again. Cause you didn't make sure they were covered. Does that make sense? So just make sure your people are covered. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. ask Jen about that. Cause I think there is a form. Yeah. I think there is a form. Like I've just, I don't even know if I may have used it once years ago. But it's like just slowly coming back to me. I think that I mean there has to be a form. There's a form for everything. So yeah, yeah. Um, Him and then you. The the question I had back about this: Why are leads different than contacts as far as the amount of touches, and why is the number of times you contact a lead, I mean almost half of what you contact a contact. Right. So like, and this is like still in my brain, not completely cemented in either, but from, from what I understand, it's, it's just a matter of like the quality and priority of the lead. So it's like, is this someone I met in an open house and I've talked to a couple times, Mm -hmm. or is this like my neighbor, my brother, my cousin, my grandma, like people in my life, um, people I've done deals with in the past, um, someone I've, you know, I've worked with at the car dealership in the past, like you have a working relationship, you, have, you actually have a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand, like this area, the leads, the yellow column is like the dating process. You're like <laughs> trying to get them to kind of sign on, like buy in to being part of your life, if that makes sense. Okay. Does that help? So let's, um, Julie had one thing and then let's go through these. Sorry guys. I'm such a chatter. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so I'm going back to the blue house. (laughs) Going back to the blue house. (laughs) So this is going to make me sound either rude or nice, (laughs) depending on what take you want to put on it. So Peter's going to drop the price of the house, okay? He's not going to drop it until Thursday, okay? So I'm sitting here going, okay, well, I obviously want Peter to get the higher price. I obviously want this client to get the lower price just because... Obviously he hasn't made an offer yet. So what is it? You know what I mean? But I'm not his agent, so I'm not there. So I guess I feel guilty going to Peter and saying, Hey, can I go and tell them that you're dropping the price? But at the same time, I want him to get the higher price. So I don't want him to feel like I'm not. We've we've done this. We've done this. So you're all good. Just check with Peter, but he'll say, yeah, tell him. That's what he's always told me. Just tell him. Um, because what a listing agent loves is, sorry, this is a little off topic, but you might as well know what a listing agent loves is um, offers. And I don't care if the offer is like $200,000 under, because guess what I'm telling the next realtor? We have an offer. I swear, that's all I care about. If I have only two offers and one of them's crappy, I'm like, hello, freaking Luya, because I have some leverage here because I don't, I don't have permission or any obligation to disclose what that offer is. And I'm going to keep that close to the vest, but I have an offer and that's all the other person needs to know. And it may just take that. And seriously, and that sounds like, maybe that sounds shady, but your, your job, your fiduciary duties are to your person. And so if that one fact gets this other person to write a higher offer and your people net more, you've done the right thing for your people. Sounds fishy. <laughs> at our open fishy, no, at our open house, so I had I had a letter with me, a really good friend of mine. And we actually on the sign-in sheet, we actually put a few fake people down. So that way, when somebody came in, they didn't know they were the first. I did too. Who else does that? I don't, I totally do that. Um, yeah, no, you're all good. It makes them feel like, oh, there's nothing wrong. People actually want to see it. Yeah. And, and open houses are changing. Like look, last year I had a few where I literally counted a hundred people coming in the door. I think those days are over. Like that was just like a hot mess. It really was. It was awesome. I made the most of it. I closed six deals off of open houses last year out of my 19 total. So like half of them were mine, half of them were Peter's or someone else's on my team. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. But no, it's sales is perception. It just is like, yeah. And humans are like, Oh, someone likes that. I, well, I like it. You know, it's, it's just human nature. Um, so let's just go through this. Like, so leads 19 touches to connect. So you're really just trying to connect You're you're in the dating process. Right. And then you're going to cement the relationship. And once they're like, once they've bought into having a relationship with you, then you're going to do your 36 touch. Who's planning on going to Brady Summers class today? I am like so excited for that class. I think it's one to two 30. So one to two 30. Um, he and Becca Summers are like masters of they're They're also really good at SOI, like nurturing their SOI. Um, similar to Peter. And, um, and Brady's like a master at marketing. Like they're such a power couple, but, um, I'm excited to see what he has to say because he'll go more in depth and like the timing couldn't be more perfect because we're talking about this now and he's going to go super, you know, deep dive into that topic. So to connect your, um, you're doing your, your quarterly phone call, you're going to just send them the monthly, whatever. So they come in on an open house. Is it okay if I email you updates on the market? Sure. Okay. So you're adding them to your email list. They're automatically going to get whatever you send out on the monthly. So if you don't have a monthly, whatever, um, just, it doesn't have to be amazing. Just like most people don't even open it. Just having the, um, your name and the memo in the top, it's, it's a touch, you know what I mean? And if they're a little more ready to sell or buy or whatever, they might open it and read through it. So make it quality, but just like, if you only have time to do something short, grab a graphic online, put a few market updates there, add a funny story, just whatever, make it quick and simple. Just get it out. Just get it out. Um, done is better than perfect in this area. Um, and then over time you can refine it. If that makes sense. Um, I don't know if you're like me, but as a new realtor, I was like, I'm learning a million things I could do. And how am I ever going to have the, the energy, the brain space, the time to do all this, just get it done and refine it over time. Um, and that's something I've learned. And as I've done that, I've gotten more deals because of it, honestly, like done is better than perfect. Um, and cause there's so many realtors out there that do an amazing job and that's what you're seeing, but there are so many realtors who just send out crap, whatever, but they're consistent and they're getting pretty good business too. So, um, if that's all you can do, just do it and then refine it as you have time. Um, and then the two touches for like direct mail. So that's your like little map or your um, postcards or a little calendar, you know, whatever it is um, that you're mailing out, or you could call that a pop by too. If they seem like a really promising lead, don't waste time on things on people that you're like, I might never do a deal with them, but if they seem promising, you've had some, you know, you established good rapport at that open house or whatever, you might stop by with that little calendar or whatever, rather than mailing it. Um, and by the way, like if you get a name, if they own a home, you can look up their name on county records because it's like, you're not going to ask someone for their address at an open house, for example. Sorry, I keep going back to the open house thing. You guys just learned about open houses and I love open houses. That's so always on my mind, but you can look up their name. Peter does this all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, county records, right. I can do this. You just look up their address and just put it in there. Um, Cause who cares if they don't want it, they'll trash it. Right. Um, with phone calls, you obviously have to be more careful because of the do not call list. Right. But with mailers, it's like, grab their address, send it out. Um, and then one touch and this, like, I try to be really judicial about this too. Like, yeah, get them out to like, if I'm doing a game night, I like to do game nights that cost me 50 bucks in refreshments. And I do it here and it's easy. And it's really nice to invite people to my office. So they remember that I'm a realtor without me having to say it. Um, so maybe this kind of touch, it doesn't need to be expensive if you don't know that they're really going to like become part of your sphere and do a deal with you or send you referrals or whatever. Um, and then the really promising ones, maybe, maybe the investor that you had a good conversation with. And it's like, man, if I land this person as a client, they're going to do so many deals. Like those are the ones I'm like, come to Splash Summit, you know, just, yeah, I'm going to put money into that and, you know. And because you'll probably get a, a pretty good return on it. Um, and then one to cement the high value touch that solidifies the relationship you've just established and opens the door 
for future interactions. What do you guys feel like that could be? Oh, and on Zoom, do you guys, are you guys still there? You can chime, <laughs> sorry, you get like legit, just start talking and feel free to chime in. I need to pull up my notes on this one piece. I'm not telling you the wrong thing. But in the meantime, what do you guys feel like just intuitively? What's something that was like some mental relationship? I, uh, I really feel like any sort of the events would really cement a relationship, like making it a big deal to have them there. Yeah. Making them not feel like a number. Making them not feel like a number. And how would you do that? <laughs> a lot of things is time, quality time, making sure that you, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're here. You know, how was your day? Da, 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 whatever it is, but the time spent so they don't go, oh, hey, you're here. Thanks for coming. Okay, see ya. And then you're off. Being able to try and talk to, talk to them, be there quality, genuine. I, I tried to introduce them to other people in like a lender. I love it. Um, yes. If they're, if they're a new buyer and they don't know what they're doing and they are brand new, it's like, Hey, have you gone with a lender yet to get pre-qualified? And they're like, well, no, where do I start? Well, I yeah. like to have a good relationship with but I'm like, hey, since I've already got your name, your number, can would you mind if he called you? And they're like, well, yeah, of course. And then the lender that I trust calls them, pulls their credit, and all of a sudden they're on fire because they're like, guess what? We're pretty qualified up to 600000 We didn't even know that. Yeah, let's go find a house. I follow up with the lender. He follows up with me. He's like, these people are good to go. Here's their pre-call contract. And we're off to the races. We don't just have one person me working for them there's now a couple people and now the lender's also following uh dropping mining hey has he taken you out have you met with him do you have any questions for him and then that's 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 my two cents that's awesome i love it i do that a lot and i do it without even thinking about it it's just like i know that if they're talking to my lender my lender's going to keep me in the loop <laughs> and that's the relationship. Okay. So just what the text says in like the instructor manual is that the cement touch is a high value touch that offers a strong first impression and sets the tone for your relationship together, which is interesting because it does follow like all these touches that you've already done. Right. So, um, so maybe at an open house, if they are there and ready for that conversation, like, yeah, you get them like set up with the lender and that's, you know, that's a quick way to just get the ball rolling with someone. But for those who are further out, like maybe you're doing these touches and then when you're checking in, maybe on one of those quarterly calls or texts or whatever, um, that's when you're having that conversation. It's like, yeah, I think, I think in the next three to six months, we are going to buy. Awesome. Do you have a lender who's been helping you? prepare for pre-approval, pre-qualification? Actually, no, like cement the relationship. So adding value, especially giving them a person who they need and they don't like, they're, you know, people are so interesting about lending. They're like, I don't know who I should talk. Like, should I talk to the bank? Should I talk to a credit unit? A lot of people don't understand the local lenders are, you know, much, much better as far as a listing agent is concerned. Um, and so they, they just don't know how to approach it a lot of times. So if you are the person that solves that problem and answers that question for them, you're their favorite. They're like, oh man, this person, I'm so glad I talked to them. Right. And that's what you want. Like, oh, I'm so glad I talked to them because then you're the person they're going to come keep talking to. And then you're going to be the realtor. Um, Steph, more can thought. you hear me? Oh yeah. Go for it. I was just going to add, I got a listing last year off of someone who was in my database, but it wasn't someone that I ever would have like directly reached out to to be like, Hey, have you wanted to buy or sell, you know, but he had posted on Facebook looking for some like home repair things that he needed. And I was like the first one to like send him a couple connections that I had worked with. And just based off of that and being able to say like, yeah, actually I've you know, referred these guys to several of my clients, or I have several clients who have used them. 
he then used me as his realtor and he was planning to just use homie to sell his house. But because I was like the first one to jump in with those connections and to be helpful. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is just like, for me, a lot of times those, those touches are just me giving them valuable help or information yeah. when oftentimes they don't even know that they need it. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Connect them with the right people, the right solutions, the right resources. That's a really good way to cement. And then kind of along the lines of what it says in the instructor manual, just having like a high value conversation with them about like what you can do to help them. And it's all, it's all about them. It's not like, I actually don't like the phrase. What can I do to help you? It's like, what do you need? I'd love to help. You know what I mean? Just hear the difference there. Um, so you have that high value conversation of like, so what are you trying to do? Well, my brother and I own this investment property together. We bought it years ago. We're trying to like, should we 1031 exchange or should we do that? You know, like, and you're having that high value conversation, giving them some advice and connecting them with, um, the right people <clears throat> like, oh, I got a lender who does a lot of 1031 exchanges for my investors. This is what we've done with our clients in the past. And let me give you his number too. So you can call him and get even more questions answered with him. Um, so that's a good way to submit. Yeah. So, um, I kind of passed on it, but I'm coming back because I need to know. Um, I know that the, the general rule is, you know, give three people, um, you know, so like I've been calculating my next Facebook post that I wanted to make today because of one thing that you said, and I, is something I didn't realize that you should be working with a lender for six months to a year before you're ready to buy, just so you can prepare, you know, yeah. fix anything you need to, whatever, all that. Right. And right. if you can, some people get like, it's a surprise, like, oh, my company's transferring me. Right, but if right, you're thinking right. about it and you can, yeah. Cause well, don't, people, cause the other thing is be careful not to freak your clients out and be like, oh my gosh, well, if I'm not three months out, we're screwed. You know, like it takes right. that long to prepare. So just well, no. make it clear that like, if you have the time, if you know, if you know, you know if you know, you'll be moving saying. in the next year chat, you know, well, that, it, but, it will be a benefit, but to also you. people know when they don't have good credit. And so, but they also don't know that they should be working with somebody to yes. help them. Yeah. That's the thing is people go, I just don't have good credits right now. So I'm just trying to fix it. They're trying to fix it alone. Right. Stop trying to fix it alone. Yeah. That's kind of my like point people who know that you know, right. need help. So anyways, um, and tell them to a lender can help you. Like you don't have to go pay a credit repair company. And right. some of them do offer a lot of value. I've used it. I've used credit repair companies with some clients and it's been great, but sometimes they're expensive too. So not everyone has to do that. So it's like, first talk to the lender, right? See what advice they can give you. Most of the time, my clients are getting the, the, um, what do you call it? I don't know. They're getting the problem solved right. with just my lender. Um, some go a little deeper and that's when my lenders, like they might want to look at a re credit repair company, right. but yeah, if you're the one telling them that they're like, Oh, I don't have to pay 500 bucks to repair my credit. Sweet. You know, right. that's, that's a huge value add, but, but wait, hold on. But the question is because I know that I'm supposed to recommend multiple people, but I want to go and make this post. I also want to just go and post. And, you know, if you need somebody call Jess. But because it's a social media post and I'm only recommending a person on this post and it's not directed towards one person, is that legally okay? Say that again. It, okay. Because it, if you were, oh, you if mean you were, just making an client, open announcement rather than a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Yes, if you were my client, I'm legally supposed to give you three people so you don't come back and I look like I'm biased and whatever all that legal stuff is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I do stuff like that all the time. Like, okay. Hey, one of my go-to lenders, Andy Larson, I tag him, talk to okay. him ahead of time. Obviously, like he has helped four of my clients this past year, help okay. fix their credit within three months so that they could buy a lot sooner than they thought. Okay. If this is you give him a call okay. because you're probably in a much better spot. You probably have a lot more potential with your credit and buying power than you think. Okay. Give him a call. I just want to be able to market her in my post, but I just want to make sure that I'm allowed to do that because I'm only marketing one person versus. Yeah. And it's not like a legal, it's not like a law that you have to present three, 
um, but that's different but, lenders, but, that's but you're supposed that to do the that. Best practice. It's the best practice. So it's yeah. not a law. I'm just saying like, don't freak out. You're not breaking Sorry. the law. If you've told your person, <laughs> I've got my one lender, talk to him. A lot of people do that. It's best practice. Cause yeah, if something gets screwed up, it's on you. I've had right. one, I've had one of my go-to lenders that almost every client I've ever used <laughs> loves. I had one client that's like, I didn't like him. I don't think you should be recommending him to your clients. <laughs> Tell me more what happened. It was like a weird misunderstanding and like a yeah, little bit of mental health issues that like I could tell that she took something super, super personal and twisted it and didn't fully understand. And I'm like, he's the nicest human I know. <laughs> so like, and I talked to him about it and it, he went in depth and, you know, and I was like, okay, so maybe let's avoid this part of that conversation in the future. Let's do this differently. But at the end of the day, you know, so, I mean, you just never know. There are people you're going to work with that you met at an open house and there are people with mental health issues out there. You guys for, for real, you're going to run into them. And those are the people who are going to go nuts and cause trouble for you and your license and your lenders and your business. And so it is best practice to provide the three. That's why I love intro lend. If you guys aren't using intro lend already, like hop on it. I've just been trying to get my lenders, like, please get into intro lend. And I just have a heart to heart with them. Cause when I first got in the business, I went to lunch with the lender and I was like, oh yeah, real estate school. They told us we've got to have our three lenders. So do you mind if I have you and I've got to meet a couple more like you and a couple more. And I put you guys on my website as my preferred lenders. And she was just like, um, no, that's not how it is in the real world. Like, I don't really want to be, I don't want to have to compete with two other, like, it was just so weird. And, but I learned over time that like a lot of lenders feel that way. They don't want they want to be your go-to person. If they're going to co-market with you, sponsor events with you, stuff like that. They don't want you in business with another lender. Um, but like that's evolving. Um, and I love the intro lend kind of gives me a neutral ground to be like, look, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Like I put you in intro lend and I am picking you by name. When I send the link to my person, there's a wholesaler. And then I'm picking one other, but this keeps me out of trouble with my clients. And you explain to the lender, like, this is why this is what could happen. No matter how great you are. I don't know if this person's a nut. Okay. <laughs> like I, I can't risk my business, my, my, uh, livelihood, you know, to, you know, to make everybody happy. So what I would like to do is this. So, um, Sorry, I am a tangent person, but anyway, but you guys, you guys get what I'm saying, right? Like just, it, it is best practice to have three out there, but no, it doesn't hurt. Like I've got a lender that like, I'm planning on doing a video with her at an open house. She did it with someone on my team a couple months ago. And it was like in front of the house at the open house. And I was like, Hey, by the way, this is what's happening with rates and with mortgages. And I got this one program that might help you, um, call me, you know? I'm going to do that with her. And then I'm going to go do an event with my other guy. And you know, like, it's fine. It's totally fine. Um, sorry. Did that address your questions? I'm the tangent queen. <laughs> oh, you have, do you have a mic? Hey, what was your, I was, I was just going to say, be very careful with like the credit repair places because they're, they're the reason that I literally haven't bought a house yet. Cause we had an agent we were working with back in 2019, <laughs> that recommended we go to a credit repair place instead of just talking to the lender and the credit repair. The credit repair place uh, they said, just go find one. And so um, I did that. And then they just like what um, you were saying earlier, they pulled literally everything from like four years ago to the front of my credit and my credit dropped like 60 points. So yeah, wow. wasn't, wasn't fantastic. So lenders always give you the best advice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, not all credit repair companies are created equal and most of them are crappy. So just, and just as a practice, you guys just don't recommend any company or service or anything to your clients unless you have used them or some of the top agents in this office have mentioned, I recommend these guys to all my clients. You know, like do, do a little bit of recon and make sure they're legit and they're helpful. Um, and you're going to be doing that if you always have your client's best interest at heart, you know, it's like, well, if it was me, I'm not just going to sign on to work with these people unless I do some digging and make sure they're legit. And I'm going to treat my client like I'm going to treat myself and I'm going to do some digging before I recommend. So definitely um, there are a couple of decent ones out there 
but, um, yeah, go to the lender first and then do some digging, make sure you're recommending the right people. Um, and that's as easy as hopping on the Westfield agents page and being like, Hey, I'm looking into this company. Has anyone ever used them for credit repair? And, or do you have a recommendation for that? Um, and then, you know, there's so many good agents that do so much business. There's a handful of people who will be able to recommend something to you. Okay. So, um, so once you cement the relationship, they've like fully bought in, right? What is that? They like fully bought in and now they're like legitimately in your database. Like, and maybe you call that a database and this is your data bank, right? This is where you're actually making your money. This is your sphere. Um, for me, this is almost like my top 50 or my top, like we do a top 50 on Peter's team. Really my top 50 is like my top 75. A handful of them are like two people in a, like as a couple, but I have a good rapport with both of them. They might both separately send me a referral. Um, and um, so anyway, so you got like your top people that you're gonna focus on, right? Um, and that's where this is happening. So you're gonna do the same with the phone calls. And then instead of the 12 monthly newsletter, easy, like set it and forget it stuff, you're gonna do a little bit more. You're gonna do the bi-weekly emails um, with a little bit more value. And like I said, if you have to start with the easy stuff, just do it. And then when you get to a place where you're like, I've got a couple of weeks, I want to refine this. I'm gonna really dive in and spend a lot of time on better content, plan out better content for the next 20 weeks of my emails or whatever, um, then do that. But you're gonna send out more of that. Um, you're gonna do more events. And, and this is like two events or get togethers versus one, but I'd also say again, like how expensive is the event? Who are you inviting to what? Um, cause I, I invite people a whole lot more than once over here to like game nights or like whatever I'm doing. That's super cheap play dates with a bunch of moms or just whatever. Um, but then if you're, if you're doing your bigger stuff, like your splash summits and your, I don't remember what we do. So we used to do death by chocolate and red bash as a brokerage, but then COVID messed it all up. Are we just doing splash summit as a brokerage? Alex Keller Ween, Thank you. That's the one. So splash summit and Keller Ween, like there's two right there. And like, I don't know how much each wristband costs for like Keller Ween or whatever, but it's like what six to 10 bucks per person you get them in. And so maybe you pick your top 25 or whatever your budget is. You, you figure it out. Um, and get them to those events. These are fantastic because if there's someone who say you've closed a deal with a year ago, two years ago, they're not really in your day to day. Like you don't see them very often unless you go out of your way to do a pot buy or whatever. Um, you're getting face to face here and you can actually maximize that and get two face to faces. So have them come by the office to pick up their wristband four days before then you sit. Uh, you see them there and, or you can go even further, like, Hey, I'm going to have an ice chest full of otter pops, um, in front of splash summit. So when you get there, pop by and grab one for your kids. So then you for sure, I mean, splash summit's going to be so crowded and Keller Ween is so crowded. So you can for sure get face to face with them or not for sure, but like much more probability that they're like, Oh yeah, we will get an otter pop. What a good idea. Then you're going to see them when they get their ticket, when you get their otter pop and maybe one or two more times while you're actually in the park and, you know, mingling and having fun and stuff. So, um, and if you do something like that, like, um, our team has done this both ways. We've been outside like the whole time. And then we miss out on having fun with our own families and life is short guys, like have some fun. <laughs> so like go in and enjoy it. But like, maybe you're telling your people for the first 45 minutes or the first hour, I'm going to be out front with those otter pops and then go play with your family. And then you get a chance to actually go play and mingle and have fun with your people as well. Um, and then just the four touches versus the two touches with things like the magnets, the calendars, the market report, you know, your flyer, your not flyers, postcards or whatever. Um, but this, I would also say like incorporate one or two pot buys in there if you can. And then as your business and budget grow, like if you can do several pot buys a year, especially to the people you've noticed, like keep sending your referrals track, how many times they send you a referral and those people you're popping by way more often. Right. Cause like 
you've got a really great working relationship. You don't want to lose that. Um, and you want to show your appreciation for sure. Questions, comments, thoughts. Okay, cool. I have to tell you guys, I love this so much because like I've been to so many classes and done so many things and learned so many little tidbits and taking golden nuggets from other agents, but it's so nice to sit down and review this. Um, so just a thought for the future, teach Ignite Monday <laughs> or teach something. Who went to Lee Stern's class when she was here like two months ago? You did? So what did she say about teaching? Did you catch that? Yeah. She's like, you guys, the reason I, cause it's Lee Stern. Do you guys know who Lee Stern is? She brought Keller Williams to Utah. She just hit her 50th anniversary of being a Keller Williams agent or being a realtor period this year. And she is like the most high energy grandma I've ever seen. Like, she's just like, she's like, she has more energy than I do. I'm like, what's going on? She's just amazing. And she, uh, her son has it's the Josh Stern team up in um, the Sugar House office. Her son has the biggest team in the state, and or at least out of Keller Williams that I know of. Um, and they're amazing. And she works on his team now. Um, but anyway, she has plenty of business. Like she doesn't have to take time out to teach, but she's like, I teach as much as I can. And she really does. She goes to like all the different offices. Hey, Alex. And she teaches and teaches and teaches. She's like, you just, you get better at what you do when you teach. And so just putting a little plug in there. Once you guys start getting your deals going and getting your, getting your production up, come back and teach and, and do all this. Um, cause like between this and Brady's class today, I'm legit going to like spend the weekend redoing all of my, my eight by eights, my 36 touches and, like I'm kind of doing that, the 19 to connect, but I'm not really at high level. So, you know, I'm going to go figure that out now. Cause I'm like, why wouldn't I do that? You know, it's such a, such a great way to, um, pour into your follow-up because the fortune really is in the follow-up. Okay. These are some good questions. I'll just read them out loud. And if you guys have some thoughts you want to share, go for it. Um, so just best practices for lead follow-up. What are my strengths? So consider, consider, these are just considerations for your lead follow-up pro program. Uh, what are my strengths when I work with people? How can I adapt the touches of the 19 to connect to represent me? Right? So if you're not a phone call person, maybe you're adapting that to Popeye's or just whatever, or play dates or I'm a mom, so play dates are in my brain. Whatever it is that you do where you can connect with people face-to-face, -face, maybe instead of the phone calls, you're doing that. Inevitably, you can't be afraid of the phone. You've got to like get used to the phone. But if you need to adapt it just so that you'll do it, like if you're that afraid of the phone, you're not going to do it, then yeah, you better adapt that and just get it done. Get it done how you need to be doing it. But um, but yeah, so how can I adapt that? Um, so think that over just to yourselves, I guess. Like, what are my strengths? And with that in mind, how do I need to adapt the touches? You guys all have a manual, right? But you're on a team, you don't have a manual. So it's online. Like you can just look up the, I think it's on KW Connect. Sorry, right, Alex. Yeah. So if you want to go back to that, or if you guys want to take a picture of that at some point, I can pull it back up at the end. But just think about that. Um, what are some reasons I might have for contacting the lead? What are some touches to do before and after a phone call? How am I using the conversations? Conversations to let the person know that I'm in real estate, how to contact me and how to refer business to me. When is it best for me and my business to time block for lead follow-up? How much time should it take to reach out to a lead? What will I do to hold myself accountable? What do I need to do to make sure this happens? The last one I'm going to say for me, I'm going to make sure it happens by doing what I know I can do. <laughs> so... Peter's obsessed with Popeyes and he's the master of Popeyes and I'm like not the best at Popeyes. I just feel like that just adds chaos to like picking up and dropping off from school and you know, all this stuff. Um, so for me, it's like game nights. Like I can get all my people together in one room and we're hanging out. We're face to face, you know, that's my adaptation. So I just say, that's how I make sure it happens. I just adapt it to the way I know I'm going to do it. Um, any thoughts? on answers that have come to mind for you and your business 
when I went through the questions. Anyone on Zoom? Okay, and those are like really good questions just to ask yourself and to just like outline for yourself and make a plan. If you write it down, even if it's like chicken scratch notes, writing it down is gonna solidify it in your mind. Um, maybe do a Google doc and like answer some of these questions and make a plan like, okay, I'm committing to myself that I'm gonna reach out to a lead within three hours or if I'm on a vacation, maybe 24 hours or just whatever, you know, just make the plan and then stay consistent with it and then answer some of those. And just internalizing all of that is gonna result in better habits, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Cause if you wing it for too long, if you don't create those systems that you need, it, you're just gonna be like scrambling all the time. How are we on time? 11, okay. Any questions, comments, concerns at this point? Okay, so we're doing good. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, after you've kind of thought through those questions, then you can actually make a plan. And I love how simple this looks. I mean, you look at it and it's like, how long would it take you to just write up a plan for whatever you wanna do? Um, <clears throat> so you can take a picture of this if you want or probably in your notebook too, if you've got a notebook, but it's pretty easy and straightforward. So you're doing a birthday card is easy. A birthday text is easier a call if you're big into Like my husband calls his friends on their birthday. That's his thing. And Peter does his birthday calls. So like, if that's your thing, that's an easy thing. Like connect with every lead, every quarter you can put in parentheses, birthday call or whatever. Um, but just like write out a plan. And then when you get your database, uh, we use Chime on Peter's team, but <clears throat> but we also have like, we just started using an at a glance Google sheet of our top 50. And when you're looking in there, you can see like each month, the highest value touch I did was, you know, text or saw them at a client event, or I got a face-to-face -face or just whatever it is. I did a Popeye gift. Um, <clears throat> And then if you do something else that month, that's even better, you change it. But what I, what I really like about that and probably what I'll add to it is like, what's their birthday? Do a check mark if I've contacted them for their birthday. What's their home anniversary? Um, so if you've helped them to buy a home or buy and sell, whatever it is, um, you can just like home anniversary this date. And then when that comes around, you can check it off. And that's one of your touches, if that makes sense. Oh, and this is, sorry, I'm kind of in more database stuff. This is the 19 to connect. So this is the more simple stuff, sorry. Um, so yeah, this is all the simple, straightforward stuff. And then you make your impact. Oh, it doesn't have a chart like that for the, so for the 36 touch, once they're in your leads, that's when you're going to go into more detail. And I would recommend that like, or whatever works well with your brain. Like my brain loves looking at a Google spreadsheet and I see all my people. I see when I've talked to them, how I've talked to them. Um, so I'm making sure I'm talking to, or contacting, touching in some way, whether it's a, you know, a marketing piece or a conversation, um, like have they received a touch that month at least. And then um, you can also quickly see like, oh, that person's birthday is in a couple of weeks. I'm just going to get the card out now and, you know, just mail it out today. So it's there ahead of time, just stuff like that. So it, it just helps you track everything. Um, so if you're doing that in command, awesome. If you're doing it in a Google spreadsheet, awesome. Just do whatever you're actually going to use. <clears throat> Any ideas surrounding that? Questions? Nada? Are you guys falling asleep? Breakfast is wearing off? It is for me. <laughs> um, yeah, we've talked a lot about this already today, but yeah, just going back to focusing on value. So when you're talking to people, you're building the relationship first off. Like it's awesome if you can connect them with the right people, answer their questions and concerns and whatever, but like at the very foundation of every conversation and interaction you have with someone it's making sure that you they know you care about them as a person 
and that you care about their needs. And then that leads into like, well, what are your needs and how can I help? And that's like, oh, you need a lender. Oh, you need to fix your credit. Actually don't go to that credit repair company. That's really crappy. I've heard they're really crappy. Why don't you talk to my lender first and see if he can help you or he, if she can help you. And then if your problems are a little more complex, they can refer you to, or I have a colleague in my office that has used this one company several times and speaks very highly of it. Maybe you should look into them, you know, or I've used this company before. They're fantastic. Check them out, whatever it is, but start with, start with that personal connection, add the value and then provide the statistics and data. I do that a lot on social media, but then also like once you're in real estate long enough, it just starts happening where you don't even bring up real estate. Your friends do. And that's when you're, it's like, so how's the market? Is this really happening? Is this really happening? Are rates really going up that much or just whatever? And they already know, but they just want, you know, they want you to expand on that. And it's like, well, yeah, rates have gone up over 2% or however much, um, since January. Um, oh my gosh, really, that's crazy. Yeah, I know. Like it's really affecting our first time buyers. I have this one guy who blah, 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 tell your little story, you know, um, and just, just, just share what's going on or like, yeah, I'm having all my, cl I say this a lot to my people. Yeah. Lately I've had to have all my clients do this because of this in the market and like, oh my gosh, you guys, this is so crazy. It has been a seller's market here forever, but the pendulum is definitely swinging. So like your people aren't going to know how many homes are on the market at a time. Right. So you're going to tell them like, yeah, in January of last year, there were like, whatever it was 2000, like 1900 homes on the market. And today we just went over 4,000 and that is crazy for us. And they're going to be like, Oh really? I had no idea. Yeah. And I am so excited because that means all my buyers who've been freaked out by this crazy market in the last year, can finally get in the door and buy a house. Like, I am so excited. Oh, really? No way. We've been thinking about buying a house, but we've been like, it's a zoo and we don't want to dive into this mess. You know, it's like, well, now's a good time. Cause we have a lot more inventory all of a sudden we are shifting to a buyer's market, but rates are going up. So we're, we're kind of in the sweet spot right now. Like your, your rates aren't crazy high. We're still, you know, around 5%, whatever it is. And, um, and now there's inventory. So like, I mean, if you're ready, I would dive in. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. I have to do this and this, and we'd probably have to sell our house or I don't know, maybe we'll do this. And then you just go into like their specific situation. Right. Um, and, or just talking to them about the basics. If they don't have a thing of their own, you're just talking stats with them. And then next time their neighbors saying like, yeah, we just got a job change. Like we've got to move to wherever we need to find a realtor and sell our house. Then it's like, oh my gosh, I was just talking to my friend so-and-so and they were telling me all about the market. Like she really knows what she's talking about. Do you want her number? You, know, you just don't know where those things are going to lead. So providing the value of people, I mean, people love to know what's going on so they can tell their friends, like, I know what's going on in the market, you know? So they love that, but it's also going to turn into referral opportunities too. So um, just don't shove it down people's throats. I love to put it up on social media, like once a week or once every other week, just what's going on in the market. And then when I'm face to face with people, people are asking me and I love to wait for them to ask me because I don't want them to feel like, like I was as a new, new agent following everybody around being like, Oh my gosh, do you know what's going on? I was just like spewing real estate all over them. And they're like, cool. Like they don't care if they're not in the middle of wanting to buy or sell a house. Right. But if they bring it up and ask, then, you know, you can share what, you know, and then they feel like, okay, this is cool. You know, they're so professional. Um, anyway, I, I wish you guys could have seen me as a new realtor. I was something else. <laughs> I was like, so excited about all the things. Um, and mostly, and mostly that was with my like close friends and family. Cause I, you know, you, you're very professional with all the other people, but I think I like freaked my people, like my close people out a little bit. They're like, Oh my gosh, she is a real estate nut. And so I've really toned it down, but anyway, fun stuff. But yeah, eventually people are just going to see you as the person to ask about what's going on. And that's going to turn not only, uh, that's going to turn into not only real estate, but like the economy too. It's like, well, as a whole, our nation is doing this 
And, you know, the Fed is raising the rates because this, and they're selling off all the mortgage backed securities because they were doing this during COVID and now they're doing this. And, and they're like, oh my gosh, I just learned amazing, crazy little things that I never would have known. So you're going to become the economist of choice. And that's a phrase Shoni uses a lot, which I love. Um, you're not just the realtor of choice. You're the wealth advisor and you're the economist of choice. So you're giving them the full big picture that in their busy lives, most people don't have time to look into, but it's like our job to be aware of what's going on because everything in the economy trickles down and affects what we do in real estate. So questions, comments? Yeah. I was going to say, uh, I was just going to say too, like, you never know what you, the people, let me start over. If you're like posting on social media and stuff like that, you never know what people don't know. And so like for, I have slacked off the last like month, but back in November, I just made the decision that I was going to be super active on social media and not like bombard anything, but just share like a tip a day. Right. And my four closings that I've had this year were all from that, like literally just people who would respond to something that I posted. And like one specifically was I shared a tip about VA loans and why they're so great. And I had an old college friend who I haven't talked to in like six years, reach out and be like, honestly, my husband was in the Marines for 10 years and we had no idea about any of this. Yeah. And so they, and they, yeah. And they had been in this position where they have a little baby and they were wanting so bad to buy something, but just were feeling like it was impossible. So VA loans, if you guys don't know, there's zero down, there's also zero PMI. And there's one other thing. What's the other thing? It may be a credit thing, something, but just zero down payment and zero PMI, because if you guys don't know too, PMI is huge, especially when you have these people doing like Utah housing loans that are zero down or even FHA. So that can save your, I mean, I think my buyers, it saved them probably like five or $600 a month. So anyway, just share little tips and it doesn't have to be anything crazy. That kills me. I'm like, why aren't, why aren't all the, like, why aren't the Marines or whoever like shouting at the rooftops? Don't forget your VA loans. <laughs> you know, like that. Yeah. I've had a few VA clients and it, it's just like, I mean, it's, it's so cool because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to afford that. And these people are out like serving and protecting. Are you kidding me? Like they above all others in this country deserve to have a break. So that is so cool. Like that you guys, that's the impact of a good realtor. Honestly, is like putting it out there, making sure your people know the benefits that they can, the benefits, the resources, whatever that they can draw from to make home ownership possible to make investments possible. I have a lot of people who are like just Joe Schmo, whatever, going about my busy nine to five. I don't have time to think about investments. I, you know, it's not my wheelhouse. Um, and I shared with you guys last time when I was teaching, like my brother, for example, he's a college professor at BYU. He's a music professor. He's very intelligent, but like, he's also got four little kids. Like he, he's not spending a ton of time looking into how to build for my retirement and my wealth and just whatever. But I helped him buy a house in Springville for 356. I think this is going to be the two year anniversary in October. And he probably has like 200 grand. Yeah, probably close to 200 grand in equity right now. And if he didn't have a realtor for a sister who's like an active realtor and knows what's going on in the market and has the, the is making the connections. Hey, bro, did you notice you got all this equity? Want to do something with that? You know, it's like I, I gave him a CMA. He's like, holy crap, my house is worth what? Yeah. So you're saying I have like, you know, at this point in time, you're saying I have like 160K in equity? Yeah. He's like, so I should probably do something with that, right? I'm like, dude, yes. Thank you. You know, and, and not everyone, not everyone's willing to like take risks and whatever. It's really not even that risky if you go about it the right way. Um, and that's the other thing is uh, as a realtor, you're telling them that too, right? It's like, by the way, it's a lot less risky than you think. Cause if you do it the right way, you're hedging your bets, you're putting up protections for yourself. Um, but anyway, it's like, yeah, okay, bro, we're going to do this. You're going to pull out this equity. Um, and, and we're going to do with this with that. We're going to make sure that payment 
covers um, the new mortgage on your investment property and uh, you know your HELOC that you're pulling cash out of your house on. You're going you know, to make sure you're covered. That may look like getting a really old house with a basement apartment. So there's enough rent coming, you know, like whatever it is, we're going to put it down on paper. We're going to figure it out. And maybe I'll partner with you on that. Or maybe you can partner with dad or a close friend or someone on his wife's side of the family, partner up and make sure the, the dollars and cents all line up so that you're not creating more debt for yourself each month or whatever. And maybe that means going out of state to buy a property that cash flows for a minute, get a little appreciation. And then when you're ready and a little more established in life, then you're coming back to Utah where we don't cash flow right now, but we're appreciating like crazy. And that really is the better investment. Um, but I'm not going to put you out of house and home and not, you know, make it, I'm not going to put you in a position where you can't put food on the table for your kids because you're negative cash flowing on a place here, but you know what I mean? Like you're just, you're presenting options. You're putting ideas out there that will really change their lives. And they had no idea except for you're in their life. You're the real estate expert. You're looking out for them and you genuinely want to make sure that they're building wealth, protecting their families, having home, home ownership in the first place. If maybe they wouldn't have had that if you weren't in their lives, like Alex's client who had no idea what they could do with the VA loan. So, um, cool, cool. Any last, <clears throat> any last questions, thoughts, comments? We're a little bit early, but we can wrap up if we're done. I just don't want to talk your ear off just to meet the 1130 deadline, if that makes sense. Well, I have a question. Yeah, beyond, let's do it. And Zoomers, you too. Oh, this. do you want to use the mic? Oh, yeah. So the Zoomers can hear. But it's beyond this. So it's yeah. just something that I was going to ask after. So do you want me to do it now? let me wrap it up and then let's okay. do that. Thank you for even pointing that out. Um, so I think just to summarize everything here today, it's just fortunes in the follow-up. Remember, remember, remember that most agents never make it past the second touch with people like open house leads, you know, the less even like internet leads is another good example. So be the realtor who does the third, fourth, fifth, sixth touch until you've you've touched on them so many times that it's going from your leads into your, from your database to your data bank, if that makes sense. Um, any thoughts along those lines? Okay. And I'm like super excited to go get better at my lead follow-up. Super excited. Okay. Shifting gears. You guys are good to go if you're done or whatever, but if you want to stay and chat and mastermind some more for the next 15 minutes, let's do it. You're up, Julie. Okay. Cash. Oh, Mike, do the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Cash, she might be the one to answer this. <laughs> um, but I figured I would ask it as a general because other people might want to know. So I'm trying to get better at social media and post with stories. Okay. So I posted a story and it didn't post my whole dang video. And it was really sad. Yeah, I need help crazy. with that. And I know you do stories. <laughs> I need help. Do you do what I do? And like record a video and then like splice it in my phone into five different videos. And then I post each one individually. Into my okay. Is that, is that what, is that what, is that what you do? I think, cause I've Googled that. Cause that drives me crazy. I'm like, why can't Facebook just splice it for me? Come That's on. What I but I think what they're trying to do is keep, like everything's so fast paced and everything is now, now, now. And they don't want people to drone on and on and on. Cause that's going to mess so with they want us to make their the business. Goal. They want us to be brief for... and we have to work that much harder if we don't want to be brief. Okay. I swear it's shorter than even a few months so, ago. I swear it used to be like 19 seconds and now it's like 13 seconds or something. It's very short. Can you, okay. Do you go through Instagram first or do you go through Facebook first? If you go through Instagram, Facebook will slice it. Instagram will automatically slice it. But that's only if the video is short enough. So if you have like a two minute video, because the limit on Instagram, I think is four frames of like 15 seconds. Yeah, it's two so and a half minutes. Okay, so then you will have to still splice it. But okay. at least like if you have shorter ones, that won't fit in one story, but maybe it'll fit in up to four. Instagram will now automatically do that. It gives you the option. So you have to set up the, I forget what they call it, but basically where you post to Instagram and it automatically post to Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Google that. I okay. did that recently because I'm not an Instagram person. I actually, 
very, very recently, like weeks within weeks, I have been actually doing Instagram, but I realized a lot of people like, you know, like I'm 37 and most people my age are definitely mostly on Instagram, but I'm with like all the old people on Facebook all the time. And I realized, oh, I can automatically have it post to Instagram whenever. Um, but question for you, is there a thing on Instagram where like, if you record it on Instagram, rather than recording it on your phone and uploading it to Instagram, does that make a difference in how long the video can be? <clears throat> yeah. Like doing, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Oh shoot! The people on Zoom probably want to hear this. Sorry, guys. I was just gonna say, if it is something that like you want to save and reuse, like here's a little tip: you guys save your stuff and just repost it a couple of months later. Nobody, most people don't know. And a lot of times if they do know, they forgot that they saw it the first time. Yeah. Or something like, so don't feel like you have to have like totally authentic content every time. But anyway, that's one thing I don't love is that if you record it from Instagram, you literally then have to go and download each 15 second video. So that's why I say, if it's something you want saved and maybe you're going to make that video a post or a reel because reels can now be 60 seconds. Um, so if you're going to make it that, then record it from your phone and then post story and a reel. Well, a story is only lasts for 24 hours. Reels are like what Instagram and Facebook are pushing right now. Yeah. I just noticed that was the thing. It's basically TikTok. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. But honest. Yeah. never mind. That's a different so real. Topic. So it looks like the same thing, right? But it stays on longer than 24 hours. It doesn't or? look like the same thing. It's a totally like a, what, what? a real shows up in your feed. Oh, it's just like a normal post, but it's a, it's video format. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a, sorry, reels can be way longer. Reels can be, like, reels can be way longer. Okay. Have they changed it now? There is, is now? there is a little okay. method to their madness though. You guys like, just keep in mind, like there's a reason like they're so successful. They know what they are doing and they know what people want and people want the short and quick. Like I love the little 10 second TikToks that I'm like, I have two seconds while I'm waiting in a line for whatever. And I'm on my phone and I watch one little funny video. I'm like, ha, that's awesome. And that just was like a nice, fun little pick me up. And it was so quick. And I had time for that. People don't have a whole lot of time. So just keep it as brief as possible. There are things where I'm like, I cannot get this under four minutes. I just can't. And those, like if, if those who the it, why can't I construct the sentence? If something's pertinent to someone, those are the people who will sit and watch the rest. And you'll get people who just like, I don't need this. And they move on. Just so do that, but don't do it too often. You know what I mean? Keep as much as you can brief. You can also, if you have something like that stuff, you can do like 30 seconds in your story saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I have all this info. If you want to hear all the details, go to my post. I like that. And then post your format video on your feed. That's good. Are you doing a class on all this kind of stuff anytime soon? Like this, um, this is like social media. Yeah, we did one last stuff. month. We can do another one next week. Okay. Next Thursday. So Alex is the bomb.com. And watch out for her classes. Cause like, I can't believe the things I just learned in like 30 seconds. From Let's you. do it. I'm Anybody in here next Thursday, 1030 to 1130, we'll do a social media Sweet. people. Here's the disclaimer. It will be like non-paid stuff. Cause people always come to the social media classes thinking it's like paid ads. Oh and yeah. I mean, they're great, but like, I do not believe that you have to do those. So we'll just yeah. do a non-paid, like real stories, what to post. That's awesome. And people that. just like like kind of going back to the topic we went through today and like the lead follow-up and the building of relationships, they don't want to be marketed at, like you are not McDonald's, you are not Disneyland. Like they don't want to feel like you were a robot throwing out marketing pieces. It's fine if you have a handful of those, but like make it personal, you know? Um, anyway, yeah. One last thing. And then I think Riley's got some stuff. Sorry, Riley, we're going off on tangents since we finished with that a few minutes early. Oh, yay. I
this Ignite session of classes has been awesome because I was here two weeks ago and we had a great crowd and we had a great like mastermind. The more people who are here, the more mastermindy it can be. I think today we bounced off so many awesome ideas. Okay, just so you know the reason why it was long, because I was trying to engage the story. No, no, no. I no, I have no, I have to tell you, I have to tell you this. You guys, yes. I skipped it. Don't. I know. No, no. You guys, you have but but did you did you remember you is what I was gonna tell you. Like you wanna be memorable and so now like I saw it for like a second and I was like Yeah. But I still remember but that's exactly what I was trying to do. But did you watch the story so you didn't get to finish the whole thing? No. no. Oh, that's right, because you ended it. You guys, you guys, I'm not even kidding. Okay. So I've got my 12 year old in the front seat. I've got my eight year old in the back seat. A, a spider, literally, like big fuzzy thing, drops from my visor to my steering wheel. I am screaming. My 12 year old son starts to scream because I'm freaking out. My eight year old daughter in the back is laughing hysterically at me. And then it drops down to my little, what's the thing called? You know, the gear shift, but not even that. Well, I was trying to, we're on the freeway. And so I'm screaming. I'm trying not to. Well, I go, well, and then it, well, and then it drops down. And then my son was like, it's on your leg. It's on your leg. So here I am on the freeway trying to like, ah, like, you know, and so I'm trying to get over to the side and I don't want to. And then there's a car that's already stopped on the, on the thing. So I have to press the brake. I can't just coast until, you know, so I'm pumping and my son is like, stop the car, stop the car. <laughs> he want me to hit the car in the front. And I am like, so you guys, I ended up putting a barf. I wear flip-flops everywhere I go. I ended up putting a barf bag that we had in the car over my foot. So the spider couldn't touch my toes so we could finish driving. Cause I was on the way to the orthodontist and we couldn't be late. So anyways, okay. Like you just told that story in less than a minute. Just saying. Story. Yes. yes. So do it like that. And we were super engaged. This is the other thing I found myself doing. Sorry, this is very tangenty, but we got through our material. So we're good. This is the thing I've noticed myself doing. I have this hilarious story and then I get in front of the camera to record it for my spirit and I slow it down. And I'm like, I look back and I'm like, this is so boring to watch. Why am I slowing this down? And like, cause when I'm telling a story to people, and this is why I love being face-to-face -face with people, you guys, I'll be face-to-face -face over a phone call any day or videos or whatever. Um, but I'll be like, da -da 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 -da, like that, like hopefully not too, like too much. And, but anyway, but like people are like laughing with me and I'm like, I'm totally engaging them. And then I get in my video and I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys, this is what happened. And I, and I watch it back. I'm like, this is kind of like slow. This is slow. Cause on social media, we're used to fast. And I'm like, why am I? So I end up inevitably re-recording like five times until I'm, and sometimes I have to run around and get my energy up to the point of the energy I had when the thing happened. So you just told that story with that level of energy. And that's what your people want to see in here. And that's where they're going to be watching and laughing. And I think like speed's the name of the game. So do that. That like, that was hilarious. I was kind of grossed out, but it was hilarious. So anyway, you guys legit have a rack. So any other comments, questions, it can be related to the lead gen stuff or not related unless we're, where are we on time? Are you ready to, okay. What? Okay. I love masterminding. I do. <laughs> you guys, donuts are my happy place. My dad would get us up at 5.30 in the morning on Saturday. Well, we'd get him up at 5.30 in the morning on Saturday. Ooh, thank you so much. And he would take us to the donut shop because my parents were nuts and had six kids within nine years. And my mom just needed one day a week to sleep in. So he would take us and that was like a happy memory. Anyway, we were in state, like I don't, I'm a night owl now. We were, they're like six little, and five of us are girls. We're like, dad, 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 dad. So he would like take us hiking into the mountains or to donut shop or both, or just get us out of the house. And my mom could like get some piece of sleep. Yeah. Thank you for bringing the donuts. Thank you. First colony. Cool. 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 That was fun. This was a fun class. You guys are a fun group. No, you're good. I'm going to put this down. Alex or oh, I'm Molly using the mic because I still have it, but cash said there's like night next Thursday. 
So like um, Thursday? yeah, I'm going to try and put a social media class on Friday. Okay. <laughs> Wait, why is Ignite on a Thursday this time? Mm, okay. Um, yeah, because they're trying to is that fit a typo? it in. No, oh. they're doing like, just because they are trying to fit it in within certain dates. Don't okay. forget too the thing after this mastermind, one o'clock. Yeah. Brady Summers, Go 36 to touch. Really so good. he'll do the deep dive into that one section that we went over, which will be awesome. Okay. Well, I'll put the social media thing on the calendar. Just watch for it. Sorry, the last day. Is it